Ron, and welcome to We All Be News Radio and TV, the news free Dixie for the 21st century. Greetings, family. Welcome to another wonderful, infotaining, edutaining edition of The Art of His Thinks, The Thought Provocateur. Lady and gents, scholars and laymen, boys and girls, wokeish and the sleepish. I am here once again, your brother, Brother Ron, truth seeker extraordinaire, like you all who are listening we have embraced uh, the message of We All Be, which is News Free Dixie for the 21st century, but also knowing that knowledge is the currency of the universe. This is my official review of the Malcolm X, Who Killed Malcolm X documentary currently streaming on Netflix. Um, thank you, Brother Squeaky G, for making that donation and recommendation that I do this review. I was planning on doing the review, but it's good to get support from viewers like you. So if y'all got something y'all want me to talk about, think about making a donation, a, a decent donation for me to talk about it. But I'm gonna talk about a lot of things in, anyway. And uh, people who have been followers of We All Be know that we have did extensive uh, research and interviews concerning the life, death, and legacy of Malcolm X. Um, I'm not a spring, I'm not new to this thing uh, when it comes to talking about the controversial end as well as life of Malcolm X, you know, um, yeah, it's funny. A lot of the stuff in the Netflix documentary I already knew about for over a decade. And uh, but what I like about it is that it's kind of added flesh to the bone when they got a chance to interview some of the people involved in the counterintelligence programs to uh, spy on and undermine the effectiveness of Malcolm X and the civil rights movement, even the black Muslim movement. <laughs> Um, it was interesting. I got a chance to interview FBI agents who don't know no, the infamous recording that Malcolm made in his his living room. He hit the record, I believe, in his council. The two FBI agents approaching him to try to flip some information, become a government snitch, and he refused to do so. And so he left us that powerful recording for posterity to actually interview one of the folks involved. And then also one of the people who was still around who was involved in boxing the Bureau of Special Services and uh, Investigations, the New York Police Department's version of, of COINTELPRO. You know, COINTELPRO was a program char, uh, started by Jago Hoover's FBI to uh, do surveillance on certain, certain American citizens. People like Malcolm X and Dr. King and the uh, Honorable Elijah Muhammad comes to mind. But not only just them, but white people, anybody, who challenges the status quo, who represents uh, the potential to, di to uh, disrupt the American way of doing things. So I'm thankful that Netflix decided to use their platform to get this information out there. It's funny, maybe I should, need, maybe I should make Netflix videos or some documentaries get picked up by Netflix for them to show that people understand I've been doing this work for a long, long time. Thanks to the ancestor, uh, Brother Gil Noble, because some of the footage, uh, some of the people that were featured in the documentary that came out came from his archives of Like It Is. You know, Gil Noble is a pioneering black media icon, investigative journalist who came out of New York. He passed away not too long ago, but he's the reason why we know a lot about Cointel Pro and about what really happened to Malcolm X. Uh, some of the things outside of you know what they want to tell us on a, on a, the fake stream on lamestream media. 
he actually used his show as a platform, a long running uh, public affairs show or, you know, interest show up in New York to get this information and interview some of the, the key players, primary sources and things of that nature. So uh, y'all should check out Gil Noble like it is Just trying to find it online. I'm sure they got a lot of his stuff online. I hope his estate is getting money off that stuff because he really put it forward. He paid it forward. Now, you know, Gil Noble talked about how he dedicated his life to seeking truth about what happened to Malcolm after he tried to avoid Malcolm as much as he could while Malcolm was still alive walking the earth. Like, you know, he see, he would see Malcolm speaking in Harlem. He'll go the other way. But I believe I saw an interview where he said his white colleagues were very much fascinated with Malcolm, but he was afraid of Malcolm because what he was saying that once he died, he started listening to his speeches, reading more about Malcolm. Then he saw that Malcolm was not the person he thought he was. So he dedicated a lot of his life work to trying to find out what happened to Malcolm and what is happening in black America. So check him out. Another ancestor, a righteous ancestor, y'all should check out is the late great Lester Vilt Middleton. That's Lester Vilt Middleton out of South Carolina. He had a powerful show. Like, no, that show, like it is, was up in the north in New York. His show was down in uh, South Carolina. But he interviewed a lot of uh, black figures that were, you know, protagonists for the liberation of black people in this country and abroad. So check out his archives because he passed away, say, it's been over 20 years ago since Lester Vilt Middleton passed. But Y'all should check them out. And you're not going to get a lot of this stuff from any other channel. You know, I'm telling y'all people y'all need to check out and their work to find out more about what has happened to us and for us and through us over the years and generations and centuries. So these are great sources to look up. Their stuff is available online. Uh, I was I would tell people, like, you know, they, they scrubbing the Internet. You know, they censoring. They're changing the narrative. They're rebranding the history, so try to save these things on your clouds and on your computers and stuff like that because you might not be able to find it in the near future. I know people think that's funny, but it's not funny. They actually are trying to get rid of evidence of things that actually happen uh, in our in our in our narrative. So it's important. And why it's important to support shows like these because we are giving you a narrative that you're not going to hear a lot of times from people because a lot of times I just don't get on here and just spill my mind. You know, I have my opinions, of course, but I try to do some research. I try to point you out in the right direction so you can do your own research and come to your own conclusions. That's very important to me. I do not care to listen to a lot of people. Like, I listen to, like, yeah, people say, well, Brother Ron, what do you, who, who do you listen to? Not that many people, really, to be honest with you. I don't I don't have the time. I, got, I do a lot of stuff. You know what I'm saying? My life is very active. I'm not just here on the computer. I'm actually doing stuff out there in the world doing projects, working with the community. And that's something I think that people need to get back in touch with. Like a lot of times we're not in the moment. We're too busy on our smartphones while we are in public spaces and places, not being able to connect with people, not being aware of what's going on. So that's very important to get reconnected to people because look at Malcolm X. Those guys were great organizers. They didn't have social media and all this stuff that we have now, but they were great organizers because they were forced to get out there and meet with the people, to talk with the people, to connect, to network. Malcolm traveled the country uh, putting up mosques like they were putting up McDonald's. You know what I'm saying? He put a mosque everywhere, but he had to travel, make connections, develop relationships with people. And like, you know, I remember I had to talk to a sister out of St. Louis who lived in Harlem during the heyday, the golden age of Malcolm and the Nation of Islam. She was talking about how she get out the subway. She hear Malcolm speak on the streets. She just didn't pay no mind to Malcolm. He was out there always speaking to the people. You know, he was fishing, going fishing among the people, telling this message. He said, I didn't really pay attention to Malcolm. I didn't care for Malcolm. Then one day something happened to me. And when I got that subway and heard Malcolm speak, everything just clicked at that moment. Everything started to make sense at that moment. It takes work and grind, y'all. So a lot of y'all want to be instant celebrities, want to be followers, I mean, be leaders and all this stuff, be the YouTube leader, the YouTube scholar. That's great and dandy, but the real work needs to be done in the communities. You still need to connect with people. That's important. The grassroots is important. Listen to Malcolm's speech, message to the grassroots, a message to the grassroots. Look that up. You can listen to all Malcolm stuff. People always claim that they love Malcolm, but they don't even take the time to listen to one speech in its entirety that Malcolm spoke. Or, you know, people say they're, they're Malcolmites, they'll quote Malcolm, but they're afraid 
to embrace the entirety of those quotes. So don't quote Malcolm, he don't mean it. You don't have to quote Malcolm, be cool. You know, it's funny, we talk about Malcolm now, they wrote out Malcolm when he died. You know what I'm saying? Like, New York Times, read a little bitch where the New York Times wrote about Malcolm as soon as he died. And they wrote him out like he was going to be, you know, forgotten. Matter of fact, it was a great insult to find out. And I've known this already before the Netflix documentary. You know, when this place where he was crucified in front of his family. This man was shot down on a Sunday in front of his family. Wife pregnant with twins. Think about the trauma that them young girls and his wife had to endure. That trauma that is passed on from generation to generation. That we don't want to talk about a lot of times because we don't understand. We always blame ourselves for things that happen to us. Not realizing that there's a bigger game at play. But they had a church dance. A black church had a dance just hours after Malcolm X was killed at the Audubon. They were allowed to have a dance. Think about people dancing and having fun and drinking punch in the same place where they killed one of our greatest leaders. One of our greatest advocates for liberation, for justice, for black America and in the diaspora. We celebrate it in that same space. It's like a blood sacrifice ritual. It's like it reminds me when Clyde Davis decided to still have his pre Grammy party at the Beverly Hills Hilton as his protege lay butt naked on the on the floor, from my understanding, for hours. Whitney Houston. That's what I'm talking about. So Clyde Davis still had his little bacchanal, whatever you want to call it, pre Grammy party, while his protege lays butt naked, you know, in a crime scene or whatever you want to call it. So, I say all this to say, and also, there's another thing y'all gotta understand. Normally, when Malcolm held his uh, rallies at the Audubon, there'll be at least two to three dozen police officers outside and inside the building, the facility. But that day, there were no police officers around until after Malcolm was killed or assassinated or shot. The police could not be found. Same thing with Dr. King. When Dr. King used to come to Memphis, he would always have an all-black Memphis Police Department security detail. Last time he came, he didn't have such protection. You know, the guy who used to organize the black police security detail, Captain Jerry Williams, he's in his 90s right now. And he talked about that. I interviewed him on We All Be uh, some years ago. And I interviewed him again, or I captured some footage that I have yet to put out of him uh, talking about, you know, uh, guarding Dr. King. See, all this is interesting, even with Nipsey Hussle. His place will be surveyed by the LAPD. Days on days in the day Nipsey Hussle get killed, the LAPD is nowhere around surveilling uh, his property. So you got to understand there's always an inside job. Whatever you may think about who did the actual shooting or who mastermind, know that there's always an inside job. It's like, at the end of the day, it don't even matter who pulls the trigger. It's more important to find out who told the guy to pull that trigger. The the, 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 the machinations behind it all. Develop critical thinking. So I just told y'all right now, the Malcolm thing was approved at the highest levels because he had no police out there the day he got shot down in front of his family. When normally it'd be two to three dozen, two to three dozen police outside. Also, William Bradley, you know that Al Mustafa Shabazz, I believe that his name is, his Islamic name, the shotgun man. You know, you've seen the Malcolm X movie made by Spike Lee, guy come down with the shotgun. That was the fatal shot, as we learned in the uh, documentary on Netflix, that killed Malcolm. Go back. All right, I'm going to post my playlist of all this Malcolm X videos and shows I've done over the years. Like I interviewed uh, Malcolm X nephew several times for many hours, Ronnell Collins, who is the son of Malcolm's eldest, I guess y'all would call him half sister, I don't do that, but his eldest sister, Ella, who lived in Roxbury in Boston, the neighborhood of Roxbury where Farrakhan is from. Uh, she was really the one that convinced him to convert to Islam, supported his many ventures, including his trip to Mecca for the pilgrimage. She was the sponsor for that, and she also started the tradition uh, of paying homage to Malcolm at his uh, grave site on his birthday in Ferncliff Cemetery up in New York. So I interviewed his nephew, Ronnell Collins, also wrote The Seventh Child, because Malcolm was the seventh child of his father. If you know, we know about, we got, got into numerology a lot, and we all be with the recent death of Kobe Bean Bryant. But it's, it's, it's good to note that Malcolm was fascinated with the number seven throughout his old life. 
the number seven, of course, seven child. He spent almost, uh, almost seven years in uh, prison. He was married to Betty Shabazz for almost seven years, I'm not mistaken. Y'all can correct me because people love to correct black men. Let's do the research. I'm trying to get y'all do the research. He was the minister of Mosque Number 7 in Harlem. Even the five killers allegedly came from Mosque Number 25 in Newark. Two plus five is seven. See how it works. But getting back to what I was saying, I interviewed Dick Gregory. Dick Gregory was animate that the guys who were the alleged assassins were shooting blanks. They were shooting blanks and that the actual kill shots came from above because the bullets were going into Malcolm in, a, in downward uh, motion. They went downward according to Dick, according to the things he saw as far as the fouls. Now people, you know, oh, don't dig it full of crap and all. But look, think about it. Okay, even if they may not be true, the fact that the other guys had guns, but the one that really killed them was the shotgun. The other, he could have survived from my understanding based on what the documentary is saying. He could have survived the other so-called shots. It was the shotgun blast to the chest that killed him with the pellets. You understand? So maybe Dick had a point. Then Dick said that also the CIA was checking out the facilities just a week or so before Malcolm was hit. Now, the documentary said who killed Malcolm X, right? It talks about, it implicates several different factions who wanted to see Malcolm dead or they want to see some harm come to Malcolm or his effectiveness to be limited. You know, you talk about the FBI, Jacob Hoover, the memos, you got to do something about this guy Malcolm, got to get Malcolm. Like in the movie scene, that actually happened. And the Spike Lee, a lot of Spike Lee stuff was kind of dramatized, composite character stuff. But that scene where he went to police station march when one of the brothers got beat up by the police, that actually happened. And that quote was actually said, that's too much power for one man to have. That actually did happen. So black history is better than science fiction and Hollywood movies or Hollywood movies. We read, we have real superheroes and she rules, you know, Malcolm was one of them. So that scene where he was directed the fruit of Islam, how go back home and pointed thing that actually happened. And that, that the crowd dispersed because Malcolm had that type of pull, man. He was from the streets. He was a street guy. He understand the hierarchy and all the chain of command and stuff. That's why he was just an effective um, recruiter and, and spokesperson for the nation and also organizer in his own right. So Duke said, I mean, Dick said they were shooting blanks, right? But, you know, the shot was Dick said he had information that the shots came at a downward spiral and downward into Malcolm. That might be true. Just same thing like you looked at by Dr. King with them guys and Andrew Young and then was pointing Seeing upward across the street, Dr. King got hit. The shots came from downward. I mean, it came upward. It didn't come like downward, like they came upward, hit him in his face, knocked his tongue and all this stuff out. So, oh, y'all gonna say, well, run around, I don't think that's true. That's fine. I'm just putting stuff out there to ruminate, to marinate in your, in your thought process. And I just want y'all to do your own research, but. Go to my playlist. You can listen to Dick Gregory talk about that, uh, about Malcolm and other people, Ronnell Collins. And also we interviewed uh, brother Roland Shepard, a white guy who used to hang around Malcolm's rallies. He used to sell newspapers. I believe he, I don't want to say he was a con, he was a socialist. He used to sell the socialist newspaper at uh, Malcolm's rally. You know, Malcolm had, you know, he had a friend, he was friendly with uh, Roland Shepard. Uh, he was there when Malcolm got killed. And I interviewed Roland Shepard about that day. And he was interviewed, I believe, for the Netflix, Who Killed Malcolm Max? Because I think Fusion, it was a first shown on a Fusion TV or Fusion TV produced the actual documentary. And it's distributed by Netflix. And I'm on his mailing list. I believe he was interviewed extensively for this project. But for some reason, they did not run his interview. He was actually there that day that Malcolm was killed. And he talking about... Uh, you can listen to my interview in my Malcolm X playlist. So I'm going to post this right in the video description. It'll be the first thing I post. And please support we all because we're doing the work, man. We're doing the actual work, you know. Uh, a lot of y'all, some of be Johnny come lately and Gina come lately and stuff. I've been doing this work for a while. So he said he saw what happened. He went to the nearest precinct to report what he saw. But what made him not share his testimony or his witness testimony was the fact that that the person he saw that shotgun Malcolm, the guy with the shotgun, the guy we know as allegedly William Bradley, aka uh, Mustafa Shabazz, 
he was in the police precinct where he went to. And he saw him go in and out, you know, smoking a cigarette. He would take a cigarette break. So when the police officer said, okay, sir, you got some report as it relates to what happened to Malcolm today, he said, I can't remember. I can't remember shit. I can't remember <laughs> what I saw. So he played stupid because he saw, dang, okay, this guy actually killed Malcolm. This is a guy saw the shotgun Malcolm, and he's walking freely in and out of the precinct. So now I can't trust it. Then you look at uh, the day. So, you know, back in those days, you had, you know, you didn't have social media or internet, but papers sometimes run several editions. And one day you have the morning edition and the and, uh, afternoon, evening edition. So even the narratives in the, in the newspaper start to change. First, they said the cops caught, I don't know what I'm saying, I don't, I'm talking off of memory, I think, that they said they had several suspects in custody. They only had one suspect in custody, the Tom Hodge Hayer, who was shot in the leg by one of Malcolm's bodyguards. And that's, why, that's the only reason why he was caught. Had the bodyguard not shot um, Hayer in the leg, we might not even had anything to go on, especially his testimony in the 70s or his affidavit saying that it was several people involved that were not in prison with him. Like the two men that went to prison with him were innocent of the charges. And um, he actually wrote in a sworn affidavit the other four conspirators, conspirators with him, he named the names, including William Bradley, was named in the affidavit. This is back in the 70s, right? And nothing has been done. So, this is fascinating. This is fascinating. So, what to make of this? You know, this brother Muhammad, who is the uh, protagonist in the docuseries, the Imam Abdur Rahman Muhammad, Abdur Rahman Muhammad is the protagonist, the researcher. I believe he worked with Dr. Manny Mannerable. He was a kid that exposed back in 2010, 2011, uh, the steal of uh, William Bradley in a Cory Booker uh, re-election campaign. I think he was running for mayor at the time, U.S. Senator Cory Booker from New Jersey. He was featured in a re-election campaign for Cory Booker. And the steal, he put it on his blog and went viral. And Dr. Manny Marable, I believe, talked about a little bit about, a little bit about William Bradley and his uh, Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Reinvention of Malcolm X, which I had some issues with, but it is what it is. But he is interested in Manny Marable. Did, did not get a chance to celebrate his uh, accomplishment because the weekend before the book was released, he died. He basically died allegedly from complications from a... I want to say a double lung transplant. He had a sarcoidosis, the sarcoidosis thing that Bernie Mac had that took Bernie, Bernie Mac, they took Bernie Mac, the, the same thing, which is interesting because he actually was in good spirit. Like they said, it was success. And then all of a sudden he died from the complications of that. And his book is released, becomes a bestseller, wins the Pulitzer Prize. But um, who knows, was that the book he actually was working on that got released after he died? Who knows? Commander Manny Maribel was like one of the foremost Malcolm X experts. He spent like a, a huge chunk of his life researching Malcolm X and what happened to him and his legacy of uh, being involved in preserving uh, the crime scene. It used to be known as the Ottoman, now it's the uh, Malcolm and Betty Shabazz Center, the place where Malcolm X was slain. It's like the Lorraine Motel became the National Civil Rights Museum, the place where Dr. King was slain. I believe it was controlled by Columbia University, the Shabazz Center. But, um, he worked with him, but as soon as I guess Manny Mirbo died, it's kind of the fervor died to really hold William Bradley, this Mustafa Shabazz accountable or what he know. What did he know exactly? Why is his name mentioned in these things? And what does he know? He's hiding in plain sight. He's a, a very well-respected citizen of Newark, New Jersey, especially in the black Muslim community. He's a community leader, um, a mentor to young people, but yet this is a guy who allegedly shotgun Malcolm X, a guy who was responsible for killing the late great Malcolm X, allegedly. You gotta say allegedly, cause we don't really know for certain, but we, you know, we have ideas. Because like there's actual footage, film footage of him, a person that resembled him as a young man leaving the Audubon as folks were attacking Hayer for killing Malcolm X, being part of killing Malcolm X. So there's footage of this guy that looks similar to him in, uh, in complexion and build, leaving the Audubon, leaving the scene of the crime of the horrible crime, the great crime of killing Malcolm X. Um, so my question is, well, why he waits so long to try to confront this guy? Because 
in the documentary it said that Bradley dies in 2018, maybe October 24th, 2018. He passes away and shows a scene with the brother uh, Muhammad in the hotel room was distraught uh, about the passing because he wanted to confront this Bradley character. Like he basically he would be outside his home, scoping his home and former uh, areas of activity like the old center that he ran that was closed down. I just thought that was interesting that, you know, it took him years to really try to do something in terms of confronting this guy. I know New York Daily News confronted uh, this character back in 2015. And he said he didn't have anything to do with it, the Malcolm assassination thing. So he was animate about that. Man, you know, who knows? You know, and people say, well, why did the black community in Newark, you know, especially specifically the black Muslim community, if if this information was out there in the streets, how come they, you know, protected him? You know, people are people, man. You know, most murders go go unsolved. And that's a fact. That's not that's not nothing that is in dispute. Most murders go unsolved in history. You know, contrary to the 48, uh, 48 hours even, and even Law and Order, most murders go unsolved. And um, it's interesting to note, I talked about Roland Shepard. He said he saw this guy walking in and out of precinct, this Bradley character. And in the documentary, they showed that FBI documents that have not been released to the public or were kept from being released or were just hiding somewhere that they actually did point it to William Bradley being the shotgun man. Now, this is a time where the authorities were actually uh, in the process of handling cases concerning Hayer and his alleged two co-conspirators. And the people they put in jail, like the guy that said it was a shotgun man, this guy did not match the description of Bradley. The guy was a fair-skinned cat, you know what I'm saying? He from Muslim Mosque, number seven, along with Norman Butler. But he did not he did not match the description of the shotgun man that the FBI had. And they identified the man in their files as being William Bradley. This guy, you know, 6'2", whatever, dark complexion, whatever guy was Bradley. And, he, and they held that, they withheld that for, for decades from the authorities. Had the authorities known this, they probably would not even let them two other brothers ride in jail for 20 plus years. But they didn't know. And if you say, like, Ron, are you, are you being far fetched? No. This is what they do, man. Y'all trust these folks. Don't you understand that the FBI was made by taking down Marcus Garvey? Y'all talk about Cointel Pro, what they did in the 60s and whatnot in the 70s, but go back to the 1920s, 19 teens, and 20s. The FBI was started, you know, as we know it, was started by Jagger Hoover. Now, it existed before Jagger Hoover. It was a form of the FBI existed, but it wasn't as powerful. Jagger Hoover used to be a librarian. That's why he understood the power of being a keeper, a gatekeeper of knowledge and information, because he was a librarian. He had organized the library system at the Library of Congress, I believe, while he was a student at George Washington University. Now, y'all look all this up, you know, please do. Please do, because I just want y'all to find out stuff on your own and internalize the information and share it. So he started as a librarian, the most most powerful law enforcement man, law enforcement officer for decades, for most of the 20th century, or for at least half of the 20th century, started out as a librarian. But the thing about it is, his first big target was not the public enemies of the 30s. Y'all thinking about... Uh, Pretty Boy Floyd and John Dillinger, they did not make the FBI. Or Machine Gun Kelly from Memphis, they did not make the FBI. What made the FBI and got his funding was the taking down and the neutralization of Marcus Mosiah Garvey. The first black FBI agent was hired in history to take down Marcus Garvey. Just Google Agent 800, Agent 800 and Marcus Garvey and see what comes up. The guy was a World War One veteran and also a seasoned detective for the Washington D.C. Police Department. This is a cat that they used to get close to Garvey to try to neutralize him. He had several informants in the uh, UNIA, the Universal Negro Improvement Association. That's Marcus Garvey organization. Y'all understand Marcus Garvey is arguably the greatest black mass leader we ever had, in you know, in American history. He's from Jamaica. But he was the greatest black mass leader that America had ever seen and possibly the world. This man did not have social media. He was not on the radio on a regular basis. He did have a newspaper platform. He had his newspapers and stuff like that to be able to disseminate information. But this kid had over millions and millions of black folks throughout the diaspora that followed him. 
Millions of black folks follow Marcus Garvey. That would make him a threat. Man, never went to Africa, but he always telling black folks to go back to Africa. He never stepped foot on the motherland, on the continent. But he knew the power of having a connection to, a, to a countries that could back you. You know, when they were lynching Chinese and Italians and whatnot in the 19th century in America, they had to pay reparations to the Chinese and Italian governments for killing their citizens. See, when black Americans are killing America, there is nobody that can vouch for us, that can, that, that, that can demand things on our behalf. We have basically no government that really represents our interests. Yes, we pay taxes. Yes, we're citizens. But we don't have a government that really answers to our agenda. A lot of us really understand what the agenda is. And that's why I said, uh, when you come to politics, man, keep your emotions out of politics, man. Do not let the politics manipulation undermine your emotional well-being. So I try to think of this stuff as critical. There's no such thing as permanent enemies or permanent friends in politics. Once again, there are no such things as permanent enemies or permanent friends in politics. Malcolm understood this. He always stood it. Nation of Islam. I mean, Marcus Garvey worked with the Klan on certain things. They had mutual interest. They want to get black folks back to Africa. So... The enemy of my enemy is my friend or something like that. You know, politics made for strange bedfellows. But Marcus had a working relationship with the Klan back in the 20s and teens. This is, probably, this is the time when the Klan was his most powerful. This was the second coming of the Klan. As you all know, the Klan was found in Pulaski, Pulaski Tennessee. It was a Memphian, slave trader, Confederate general, war criminal, allegedly. Nathan Bifford was the first Grand Wizard. The Klan was founded by a white dude from Boston. Uh, 33rd degree Mason, Scottish Wright, Albert Pike, who was also a Confederate general, and they all lived in Memphis back in the 1860s. They all ran the Democratic Party. So, let's we'll put that out there. Permanent enemies, permanent friends do not exist in politics because a lot of you black folks love these Democrats. So, then you know, that's who started the Klan. See how it works. But Garvey did business with the Klan, right? Politics. Elijah Muhammad, the Nation of Islam, brought real estate from the Klan in Georgia. Elijah Muhammad, Elijah Poole was from Georgia. So they did business with Klan. Elijah Muhammad allowed for George Lincoln Rockwell, the founder of the American Nazi Party, to speak and attend a Savior's Day or Founder's Day. These, this is evidence. This is nothing I, I'm pulling up to try to discredit the Nation of Islam. I'm just trying to get y'all to understand how this stuff works. You in the devil's system. So you gotta you gotta make peace or make deals with the devil. It's their system. So understand what's going on. Look all this up. I'm just tired. I'm, it's like I'll be repeating myself. This is how you learn. But like the stuff I already talked about a lot in the Malcolm X videos I have. And the playlist is in below the video description. You can add this to the playlist. I'm going to add this to this playlist too. So yeah, this, this should not like be, oh my God, run. This is blasphemy. I have a lot of brothers from the Fruit of Islam that listen to this show. A lot of them listen to this show, right? I go to cities. Even Dick Gregory Fennell, they knew who I was. You brother run. I've been trying for five years to meet with Farrakhan. You know, because I have respect for Farrakhan. You know what I'm saying? I have a uh, We All Be. Have this award for Minister Farrakhan. Lifetime Achievement. We All Be Lifetime. I've been trying to give it to him since 2015. You can't know who I am. And this is my show. They act like, you know, brother one, we love you and all that. Let I me mean, just meet with Farrakhan. Give him this. I don't know, brother. But Farrakhan meet with a lot of other people. I mean, celebrities and other people and I got a war. I'm not afraid to take a picture with Farrakhan. But that's another story. But I'm just letting you know, I have no axe to grind with the nation in terms of like putting this information out there, but because it's, it's out there for the public record. And this is not to shame it. Our nation of Islam has done a lot of great things for black people. This is why I'm doing this thing, let y'all understand that when you say that the nation of Islam killed Malcolm X, you don't understand who really is behind the scenes. You know what I'm saying? Y'all don't really understand how this thing goes. You're in the devil system. You make deals with the devil, it's time you got to pay some interest you don't want to pay. Like the late comedian Patrice O'Neill said, he said, you know, be careful of the deals you make. You know, you make deals with certain people, they may want to ask bigger favors than the favor you asked for in the first place. They'll put interest on that favor. So you won't be a famous whatever. And so, okay, we'll make that deal with you. We'll make you famous. Now, you're going to have to do a favor for us later on down the road. And you can't say no. We're going to make you an offer you cannot refuse. That's, not, that's Godfather style. Make you an offer you can't refuse. So they say like, they make you famous and you're well known, you're a global icon. Now they tell you, okay, um, once you go to this uh, this function, 
and we want you to kill this guy, so and so, or her, kill this so and so. He's, oh my God, I can't do that. Oh, you can't do that. Well, we'll kill your whole family. How about that? Now you're gonna do that, ain't you? So you gotta think about the the things that at play here. So with that said, politics made for strange bedfellows. Like George Lincoln Rockwell was able to attend Founders Day, Savior's Day, what y'all call it, and he spoke before the Muslims. And Malcolm found it problematic, I'm sure. Uh, but Malcolm understand it's a game. It's a cat and mouse game. It's a dance. So also. Uh, they interviewed John Ali in a documentary. And I, John Ali is problematic to me. Now, he come out as a nice old man. You know, he's a harmless looking old man, but he was not always old. He was a young man at one point with ambition. He was actually the National Secretary for the Nation of Islam. I believe after Malcolm got kicked out of the Nation of Islam. And I believe Malcolm was the one that kind of really like, you know, sung his boasts, uh, you know, and stuff like that and talked them up. They were, they were good friends at one point. Now, we know that John Ali, based on, look, read, I got to read uh, Carl Evans' The Judas Factor. We're going to bring that back up. This book came out in 1992, around the time when the Malcolm X movie came out. I saw the Malcolm X movie. I was about 12 years old when the Malcolm X movie came out. I was a big fan of Malcolm. I had my Malcolm glasses, tried to look like Malcolm. And uh, I read his autobiography. Mom got, got me his autobiography. I read it, you know, this voraciously. I just read it. I just consumed it. That was when I was 12 and, you know. You know, white kids, white bully, ML for stole my Malcolm X autobiography in the seventh grade. That's another story. The bullies is all that bull crap. But um, yeah, I want to talk about John Ali. Now he come out as an innocent, this is a wise old man. But you know, the reason why he's still alive, cause he is wise in the way he moves in this system. But John Lee was connected to the FBI. FBI agent, FBI informant, but he was responsible for the correspondence between Malcolm and Elijah. So maybe Malcolm wrote letters because Malcolm did ask for forgiveness from what I understanding to get back into the nation, to get the get to get back in the good graces of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But I don't know if all his letters came through to Elijah Muhammad. And first he had a close relationship with Elijah, but then you know things started happening. Barriers, people start getting in the middle of all their stuff. So John Ali was responsible. Is a guy? Is this Moran McCullough? See, the best way to hide is in plain sight. Uh, hello, Mr. McCullough. Are you the same Moran McCullough that was in Memphis April? From in, were you there on April fourth, nineteen sixty? He said yes. And then we hanged up. So he had been out there, and his daughter wrote an op-ed during the MLK fiftieth anniversary assassination in twenty eighteen. She wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post. You can find this about. How she feel jaded by Memphis and about race relations, but she didn't mention that her father was Morel McCullough, D. Morel McCullough, that was involved in uh, undercover activities and was CIA. So a lot of y'all get this information, this topical stuff, but I would challenge y'all when people start mentioning names and stuff like that, look up these names. Just don't take it at face value. Start researching the background of who they people are and who they come from, who sent these people. So you start finding out some amazing things. So this is what I do. This is why it took me a minute to do my review. Because you start finding out amazing things. We start reading between the lines and reading things that ain't there and all that stuff. So let me get into that. And Elijah Muhammad, you know, politics made for strange bedfellows. Elijah Muhammad was taking, allegedly taking big money checks from H.L. Hunt. I don't know if y'all know that name. H.L. Hunt. Big Texas oil tycoon being there type of guy out of Texas, deep in the heart of Texas. But legend Elijah Muhammad was getting money from this guy. This guy had no love for black people. Uh, he was an ultra conservative John Birch Society type of cat. He had no love for black people. But guess what? His son is Lamar Hunt, the founder of the American Football League, which is currently now the American Football Conference. The conference trophy is named after him, the Lamar Hunt Trophy. He is also the founder of the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah, the one and won the Super Bowl this year in 2020. That Kansas City Chiefs. And also he was a co-founder and minority owner of Chicago Bulls. Yeah, the one with Michael Jordan. Uh, also, he, held, he was a pioneer in promoting soccer, Major League Soccer in America. He's in a 
Pro Football Hall of Fame, and then also in the Pro Soccer Hall of Fame. This guy is very accomplished in terms of promoting sports. Uh, he's one of the first uh, football guys to really pursue talent at HBCUs, historically black college and universities. Uh, he was one of the first to innovate that type of thing of incorporating those type of people. That's Lamar Hunt, the son of H.L. Hunt, and also Lamar Hunt and his brothers was in, involved in a conspiracy to own the world's market as it relates to silver. They was in a conspiracy. Him and his billionaire brothers were in a conspiracy to control the world's market on silver. And they was cut down. Uh, look up Silver Thursday. Silver Thursday, the Hunt's brothers. So, H.L. Hunt, that's his son, Lamar Hunt, found the Kansas City Chiefs, one of the founders of the American Football Conference, um, all that stuff. H.L. Hunt is an interesting character. I'm going to read a little bit about H.L. Hunt, and I'm going to read about a uh, passage from the Judas Factor uh, about the assassination of Malcolm X, written by Carl Evans, a brother from St. Louis, that came out in 1992. So this information has been out there, and I'd like to give a shout out to the, uh, to the documentary for highlighting the brother Zach Kundo. Zach Kundo has been a, a brilliant researcher on what happened to Malcolm X. Uh, it's good to have him on. And I, I, I need to do an interview with him myself. But he's been out there putting the information out there for years as well, too. So, yeah, read that book, Judas Fact. It's still worth reading. And uh, also, check out the name, Louis Lomax. Louis Lomax was involved in the documentary with, with Mike Wallace when they introduced the world to the Nation of Islam called The Hate that hate produced. He was a pioneering black journalist, a uh, very accomplished academic and um, intellect. And he actually did a lot of research about what happened to Dr. King and Malcolm X. And somehow he died in a one person crash, one person auto crash, I believe in Arizona. I think his brakes went out on him. And we don't even talk about Louis Lomax no more. <laughs> I tell y'all, Gil Noble, Lesterville Middleton, Louis Lomax, look these guys up. Brilliant. Investigative journalists, truth seekers, extraordinaires. So let me um, read a little bit, get your understanding about H.L. Hunt. Uh, but I, I try. I want to keep this on the hour, uh, but I see I'm not going to be able to keep this on the hour. Uh, please forgive. <laughs> but, uh, but let's support the movement. Man. Like we're hearing cash out, our dollar sign, our R2C2H2. That's dollar sign R2C2H2. Um, read. Let's see. Read a little bit about H.L. Hunt and also with Malcolm and from the book. Read this a little bit. And my glasses kind of, I get some new glasses, but uh, they I still see them. I just need to super glue the other end. So it is what it is, but try to get this truth out here. Uh, Harrelson Lafayette Hunt Jr., known throughout his life as H.L. Hunt, was a Texas oil tycoon and Republican political activist. By trading poker winnings for oil rights, he ultimately secured title to much of the East Texas oil field, one of the world's largest oil deposits. From it and his other acquisitions, he accrued a fortune that was among the world's largest. At the time of his death, he was reputed to have the highest net worth of any individual in the world. That's H.L. Hunt. This guy was also involved or connected to the JFK and MLK assassinations. He got connections to both. Like I say, he was an ultra right wing conservative John Birch society type. I understand. He was in that in those type of things. So let me read from. Uh, the Judas Factor. And yeah, bear with me, folks. <laughs> Glasses, my God. Let me see. Let me read this passage from the Judas Factor. Get the Judas Factor. Get online. The plot to kill Malcolm X. Let's see. So this is the passage. Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm said, had been. Depositing con contributions from his followers in a secret bank account in Switzerland. And his wife had been doing the same in accounts she held in Beirut and Cairo. Although the Nation of Islam re received hundreds of thousands of dollars in donations each year, Malcolm X said, the accounting books he examined in the messenger's office 
revealed that the nation of Islam was spending far more cash than followers were contributing. When Bradley and Jamal inquired how this was possible, Malcolm X's reply hit them like a bombshell. There is a Texas millionaire who supports not only Elijah Muhammad, but the Minutemen and the John Birch Society, Malcolm X said. His name is H.L. Hunt. I think he is in oil. Have you ever heard of him? Bradley had, but Jamal had not. Harrison Lafayette Hunt wasn't just a millionaire. He was a very racist, very right-wing spendthrift who was worth nearly half a billion dollars in 1960. According to a lawsuit filed against him, he once sold food that was unfit for human consumption, knowing that such sales would end up in Negro and low income areas. Hunt regarded African Americans as a threat to the Caucasian control of American politics. He made clear in numerous radio broadcasts and interviews. During a radio broadcast in mid-1960, Hunt exposed his abhorrence of African Americans. We are now in an area where whites, however free from racial prejudice, will be forced into the Republican Party by the Negro population, which will help control the National Democratic Party and undoubtedly share or preempt many local offices. Hmm, interesting, right? So great was his fear of black political power that within days of Kennedy's November 3rd of, of Nixon, Hunt contacted the Republican National Committee to request that it study why the rural vote went to Kennedy. Alfred Zoll, one of Hunt's chief ideological allies, has since 1936 advocated sending all African Americans back to Africa. Hence, it's not really surprising that he would be interested in financing the Nation of Islam. On October 28, 1960, Hunt, who opposed then-Senator JFK's presidential bid because Kennedy was Catholic, admitted to mailing 102,000 copies of an anti-Kennedy leaflet in an effort to win the Democratic nomination for Texas Senator Lyndon B. Johnson. A few days later, he announced that he would support Kennedy's race for the presidency against Vice President Richard Nixon. Hunt's decision was unusual given his hatred of Catholics and the fact that he had financed Nixon's bid to gain the vice presidency in 1952 on the Eisenhower ticket. In early 1963, Hunt's commercial corporations were linked to the anti-Semitic Liberty Lobby and the John Birch Society. On November 18, 1963, one of Hunt's sons, Nelson Bunker Hunt, donated money which was used for a rancid anti-Kennedy ad that John Burr Society supporters wanted to run in the Dallas Morning News on November 21st, the day before President Kennedy was scheduled to arrive in Dallas. On November 21st, the day the ad man, a mafia member from Chicago named Jack Ruby, went to H.L. Hunt's office, as did other characters whom history would link with the event that occurred at 12.30 the next day. At 12.23 on November 22nd, H.L. Hunt watched as Kennedy, the man he hated, drove in a motorcade through Daly Plaza, excuse me, through Daly Plaza. Minutes later, President Kennedy was dead and Hunt was on his way to a month-long stay in Mexican Hathaway. Three days later, Ruby killed Lee Harvey Oswald, the man accused of assassinating President Kennedy, and who, for unexplained reasons, had a personnel file at CIA headquarters in Langley. So that's from the Judas Factor. Look up H.L. Hunt. This guy was a very powerful businessman. Also, I guess, a supporter of the Nation of Islam. For whatever reasons, politics made for strange bedfellows. Also, he controlled, he controlled a lot of the media as well. They didn't talk about the radio broadcast. So, and Lyndon B. Johnson, the president, he owned radios. I mean, Lyndon B. Johnson was one of the wealthiest presidents we ever had in history. He started off as a school teacher in East Texas. <laughs> he didn't want to become one of the wealthiest presidents in the history of the United States. He owned radio stations as well, too. But let's not talk about those things. Let's not talk about in the thing. I know Dick Gregory talked about he met with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and he showed him a big check he got from somebody somewhere. And he just said that in the interview we did uh, about Malcolm Martin. He talked about that, you know, and um, 
Now, I just think people need to start researching. Like, you know, kill Malcolm X. Hell, it's quite evident that it was government involvement. You know, the Nation of Islam was not powerful enough to keep Malcolm X from going into France. The, the government of France was warned to not let Malcolm X into their borders. They was warned ahead of time that he would be assassinated. You know, I, from my understanding, Malcolm contacted the State Department two weeks before he died. He was in fear of his, he was in fear of his life that he was going to be killed. You know, you you know, you got uh, the diary of Malcolm X just came out with Herb Boyd, the great journalist, and also uh, Ilyasha Shabazz, I believe they helped with the book, basically his diaries. Malcolm talked about his travels. You know, Malcolm was food poisoned, I believe, twice. He almost died. He had to get his stomach pump. You talk about being followed around with white dudes in suits and stuff. So this is the government, though. This ain't the Nation of Islam doing this. The Nation of Islam is not powerful to deny uh, Malcolm X passes into France. This is right before he died. You know what I'm saying? He had to, you know, he had, they tell you, you can't come in our country. And then his friend, you know, in, in Kenya, the journalist, you know, the uh, the, the the Indian king, uh, Pinto, got killed not too long after Malcolm got killed. You know, assassinated in front of his daughter. You know, I believe in front of his house. Look at Pinto, Malcolm's friend. He, he wanted to help convince Malcolm that the United States should be brought up on charges against human right uh, for human rights violations. Excuse me, against African Americans. He was going to bring up the United States on charges before the UN and the United Nations. You know, he had African delegates and ambassadors. Quoting Malcolm X on the floor of the UN, and you know, uh, like Jay Hoover said, this guy's a problem. This he's a black messiah. He's a problem. He's riling up people. He's getting diaspora all riled up and stuff. He's making connections and relations. He's the black president of Black America. When he come over to African nations and heads of state, they treat him like he's the president of Black America. Like he is our president. He speaks for the 22 million African Americans at the time, or Negroes, or whatever they want to call us at any time, but. We got to study that. See, it's not just the nation that may want to see Malcolm done with. There's a lot of enemies he made. So when you got a person like that get killed, there's a lot of people, a lot of enemies who benefit that we know and don't know. Um, I believe I saw an interview. This is available online. Uh, I think James Farmer, yeah, of course. You know, uh, James Farmer, brilliant guy. Uh, he was, you know, they did a movie about the debate team down there in Texas, Wiley College, whatever, with Denzel, the great debaters. He was the young man that was being represented, James Farmer. You know what I'm saying? He was a freedom rider, one of the original freedom riders and stuff like that, trying to integrate, you know, busing and all that stuff. Yeah, that's him. And I, he was a colleague. I believe he was a friend of Malcolm. You know, he had debates with people. He had some, he didn't agree with everything people say, but I believe they were friendly and they were respectful. But he, uh, Said that he was in a meeting with James, I mean, Lyndon B. Johnson, excuse me, the president at the White House. And uh, Lyndon B. Johnson asked him, they able to figure out who got that Malcolm fellow? Or something like that to that effect. But James Fulmer always thought, or he thought at that time that it could have been a conspiracy because Malcolm Mix was trying to disrupt the drug trade in Harlem and stuff like that. And, you know, you had the French connection, all the, you know, the government won bringing drugs into the, into the community, into the country. You know, look up the French connection. Look at Lucky Luciano. I mean, he was an informant. They sent him overseas. He helped sell the gang. The, the French connection. He helped set that up. You know what I'm saying? He set that up for the government. Heroin, all that stuff, the government bring that in. So, Malcolm was trying to disrupt that, allegedly, and he got him killed. He got assassinated because he was trying to disrupt the drug trade in the black community. That's one theory. So, there's so many theories out there. There's so many um, different perspectives on what happened to Malcolm. Now, Alleged killers, Tomaj Hager, he said he, you know, he helped kill Malcolm. They all came out of Moss 25 in Newark. Like I said, 2 plus 5 is 7. Malcolm's number is 7. And um, allegedly, Louis Farrakhan was there the day that Malcolm got killed at Moss 27. I mean, not Moss, I'm excuse me, Moss, Moss 25. That's what I heard from different sources. I uh, research that, you know, see if that's true. I mean, some people should ask him, like, you know, where, where were you at when Malcolm got killed when you heard the news? I mean, cause I don't you know, want to put anything misdirective out there, uh, misdirecting people, misleading people, but I read that, you know, he was at Moss 25, the same mosque that produced the alleged assassins of Malcolm the same day. And uh, I believe, uh, you know, you saw the footage of James 3X Shabazz, the leader of Moss 25, saying very disparaging things about Malcolm. 
he ended up getting killed in the 70s, got shot in his face several times in his driveway in New Jersey. Then the alleged killers of him were found with their bodies decapitated, their heads in a park in Newark uh, facing the east, my brother, to the east. So maybe the Muslims got involved in that. I mean, there was a lot of things that happened in the fallout of Malcolm. There was a power vacuum, people fighting for power. Uh, a lot of people got killed in the aftermath of Malcolm. I mean, even his, um, I want to say his press secretary, or the guy who worked with him, Leon Amir. Leon Amir, he's worked with Mama Ali. I think he was Mama Ali's press secretary, and I'm going to connect with Malcolm. Uh, after that, he had a fallout with the nation himself, connected with Malcolm. He was beaten up real bad by members of the FOI, from my understanding. Now, y'all can look all this up. They found him dead because he had information. He wanted to get out about what, what happened to Malcolm. He knew some stuff uh, uh, surrounding the assassination of Malcolm X that he wanted to get out there, but he was dead in, in March. They found him dead in the hotel room talking about it was natural causes. He was killed. This is Leon Amir. I want to say Leon 4X Amir, but Leon Amir is A-M-E-E-R. This guy was close to Malcolm. He had information, tried to reach out to the authorities, made it was a mistake that he trusted the FBI and he ended up dead in March. The next month after Malcolm got killed. Um, Malcolm's chief bodyguard, Gene Roberts, undercover police, bossy. His chief bodyguard, the one who tried to give him life to life resuscitation, Gene Roberts. You know, uh, they said in the documentary of nine informants in the Audubon. Gene Roberts was definitely, uh, you know, he was there, chief bodyguard. Uh, also, Gene Roberts set up Tupac's mom in the Panther 21. So he was involved in the Black Panther movie. He set them up too. Tupac's mom. They're trying, like they were trying to blow up landmark places in New York City. And Tupac's mom represented herself in court while pregnant with Tupac, I believe, and beat the case. But she got black ball or white ball, whatever you want to call it. So Gene Roberts is interesting. So it's interesting to interview the bossy people and the FBI people in the documentary. Um, what else? The, the Hanafi, I mean the Hanafi murders. You know, the Hanafi murder where those seven people got killed in that mansion up in Washington, D.C. back in 73. Was it January of 1973? You know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar brought that mansion as a headquarter for the Hanafi Muslims, there was a, a Hanafi black Muslim movement led by uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's spiritual mentor, the guy who gave him his name, who actually was a national secretary for Elijah Muhammad back in the 50s for like three years. He was a national secretary for the Nation of Islam. This guy who started the, uh, the Hanafi Muslim movement. Let me read a little bit about him. You know, the 1973 Hanafi Muslim, mass Muslim massacre took place on the afternoon of January 18th, 1973. Two adults and a child were shot to death. Four other children ranging in age from nine days to 10 years old were drowned. Two others were severely, severely injured. The murder took place at 7700 16th Street Northwest, a Washington DC house, house excuse me, purchased for a group of Hanafi Muslims to use as the Hanafi American Muslims Rifle and Pistol Club. The property was purchased and donated by then Milwaukee Bucks basketball player Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So I'm just reading that. So it was seven people dead, two injured. So that's a massacre. Yeah, it is a massacre. That's a massacre. So the brother who was the leader, the target of the attack was brother Hamas Abdul Khalis. You know, he sent, you know, 50 letters to all the mosques of the Nation of Islam, calling Elijah Muhammad a fraud. This is a guy who was the National Secretary of the Nation of Islam in the mid-50s. And he calling this guy, he said he's a fraud. And this is Elijah Muhammad. The, he called it. You know, he sent them letters out to everybody, every mosque in the country. So he created that, uh, that powder keg. But he was once known as Ernest Timothy McGee. I believe in that nation, he was Ernest 2X McGee. In the nation of Islam. Let's see. And also, y'all y'all remember he led the hostage situation, the hostage situation in 1977 in DC to bring attention to what happened to his family. You know, and he, you know, injured, he wounded somebody in his, you know, group wounded Marion Barry from Memphis. Yeah, that Marion Barry, the mayor, future mayor of DC, was wounded in that incident. And he ended up going to jail for life, this guy. 
you know, dying in jail in 2003. So, and what's interesting about him is that he also was a accomplished jazz musician. This guy was a talented drum player. He played with the likes of uh, Bud Powell, Charlie Parker, Max Roach, Billy Holiday, and J.J. Johnson in New York City. You know, Malcolm used to be an entertainer in some way. He used to be a drummer a little bit. You know, you know Malcolm was a dishwasher at uh, at that uh, Jimmy's Chicken Shack up in Harlem. His cold dishwasher was none other than Red Fox. <laughs> so they were both washing dishes at Jimmy's Chicken Shack up in Harlem. And also, you will play drums on occasion. And I said he, he, he patterned his speaking patterns after Paul Robeson, the great Paul Robeson. That's Malcolm. And uh, we read a little bit. Khalis met Tassabur Yudain Rahman and converted to Sunni Islam. Upon advice of his instructor, he infiltrated the Nation of Islam. In 1954, at the suggestion of Malcolm X, Elijah Muhammad named Khalis the National Secretary of the NOI, a position he held until 1957. Muhammad also sent him to Chicago to head the University of Islam. In an interview, Kali said Elijah once said that I was next in line to him, that it was me, not Malcolm X. Kali split with the Nation of Islam in 1958 to found a rival Islamic organization, the Hanafi Movement. In 1968, he was arrested for attempted extortion but released on grounds of mental illness. Okay. So he claimed that he was not only a spiritual advisor to Kareem Abdul Jabbar, he gave Kareem his name, but he was close to Malcolm X and also he was next in line to Elijah from Elijah Muhammad. And then when Malcolm had his split, uh, it's alleged that he used to visit Khalees at his Long Island home and talk to him for hours in his car about, you know, Sunni Islam, because Malcolm converted to Sunni Islam. So I guess he was saying he's a spirit, he was a spiritual advisor to both Malcolm X and Kareem Abdul Jabbar. The former national secretary. So this, they didn't bring this up, but there's the Black Mafia from Philadelphia, which originated from Mosque Number Twelve in Philadelphia. The Black Mafia took out their family, the Hanafi family murders, you know, and also they took out a brother named Major Coxon, who was a great and close friend of Muhammad Ali in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. They killed him in his mansion. They slaughtered him and his stepdaughter, and shot his wife, blinded one of his uh, stepsons in the eye. And one of the sons who was, I believe, 13 was able to get away and go to a neighbor house to call 911 or whatever they had at the time to call the police. But Major Coxon was allegedly a liaison between the uh, Italian mob and the, and the black mafia. And he was killed the same year in June of uh, 1973. So, you know, there's a lot of murders that taking place after Malcolm. Uh, demise, you know, this connected in some ways, a lot of internecine fighting among each other. It's kind of like, you know, you look at, um, you know, the gangs and stuff, like, you know, how Crips, all Crips sets are not friendly or weren't friendly to it. You know, you had Crips killing Crips and all this stuff. So this happened in the Nation of Islam. But you also got to realize, going back to the day that Malcolm was taken out, a legend was nine informants in the crowd. So the Nation of Islam has always been compromised by police and the government. That's what I'm saying. So even Malcolm talked about it while he was alive that the Nation of Islam they got police. They know they got police all in it, infiltrated into the nation. So when you say that the nation of Islam killed Malcolm X, uh, the government killed Malcolm X. They used them as cover. They said, you know, this is their system. This is their system. It's always an inside job. Never forget that. The, the Elijah Muhammad was not the mastermind behind the killing of Malcolm X. He did not have the power to deny Malcolm X entry to any country. He didn't have the capability to survey Malcolm's every movement under surveillance. He didn't have that type of uh, resources. He just didn't. I mean, they were talking to him, uh, Elijah Muhammad, like even they said in the, in the uh, film that they had his phones tapped 24-7. The FBI, the government did that. So they know what they're doing. And people... You know, with the William Bradley thing, that's not unusual that people hide in plain sight. You know, that's not just a black thing either. I mean, 
It was a guy named James Ford Seal that killed these two civil, uh, not two, two black men in Mississippi back in the civil rights era. They said for the longest that he was dead, the white community down there where he's from in Mississippi. Then the brother one of the victims started doing some research and found out he was still alive. He was hiding out in plain sight. Nobody, everybody knew that this cat did what he did to them two guys. And they let him live you know, freely among the people for, for, general, for decades. Then the law finally caught up with him, but even in the, in the, the Malcolm X documentary, they want us to believe that the guys who were involved, the, the real gunmen, the alleged assassins, whatever, are all dead now. They might still be alive. So it won't be surprising me, the other guys, I mean, because like the Bradley guy just died, you know, in 2018, they released Tamar's hair uh, several years ago. He's free, a free man now. And so, I, you know, it's quite possible the other three people who were alleged shooters in this Malcolm X thing are still around, but they're being hidden in plain sight. So that is for whatever reason, you know what I'm saying? And um, what's the irony is that, you know, this William Bradley character, he went to Southside High School and his alma mater ended up being named for Malcolm X. That's universal cosmic law. That's justice in a way, you know, that this dude, alma mater, the guy he allegedly killed ended up being the name of his alma mater. <laughs> so it is what it is so I mean I don't know how it feels to be somebody like that who killed a man in front of his family and people still think that's a good dude it's not for me to judge or to understand I guess but I just think it's kind of hard to reconcile that you know people like oh man he, he was uh, protecting the messenger and all this other stuff but you killed the man in front of his family you traumatized his family you took away a man with a large family with, with responsibilities and commitments you you left a, a, a wife without a husband, daughters without a father, a father. So how can you reconcile? I mean, it's kind of interesting how people like they want to justify it. Like even the people they were interview, or you know, uh, he, he made his piece. You just can't speak for. We don't know what piece he made or didn't make. It'd have been important that he got his his own point of view on tape. That would been I, I would you know been interesting hearing that part, but. He passed on, but I just thought an interest that the guy waits several years to try to confront this guy. Uh, instead of just doing it right away when he had the information come out. And it's funny to me, Corey Booker act surprised. Corey, that was back in 2010, 2011. You the senator, and I guess it filmed in 2018 or 2017. Bro, you knew about this stuff already. You just, you know, you say you know him well. If you knew the guy well, then you know this part of his story well too, Corey. When you the one who was sleeping in the projects for a, a publicity stunt at one point, ultimate politician. Always denying, denying, denying. But I mean, it's not Corey's fault. But I'm just saying, even Ross Baraka, you know, he was interviewed, the mayor of Newark, you know, and they interviewed Ross Baraka, right? The son of the legendary activist and artist, Amiri Baraka. And he said, you know, and his father allegedly was an advocate of Malcolm, knew Malcolm. And he got like, it was new or this is this in you, you know, you know, people know. They're like the phone police director, you know, he want to play this, you know, I don't know, you know, just leave it alone. And this is why we can't get nothing resolved because we want to leave everything alone. It should not be left alone. It should be, you know, investigated, looked, get, looked at again. Now, they just recently opened the Malcolm X assassination up again. Up in New York City, but what's gonna come out of it? I don't know. And then they got all the. Uh, it was amazing to see the evidence they still have in the archives, like even the the pellet removed from his chin. It was like wow, and the photographs disturbing, you know. But yeah, I don't know. Did I tell y'all enough? I think I told y'all enough for this time. Oh, David Garrow. Y'all know who David Garrow is. <laughs> Not really. Y'all saw this white dude that uh, Mr. Muhammad will always go to to help with the FBI thing, right? Look at the FBI files to interpret the FBI files. This David Garrow dude is interesting to me. And y'all should study him. Like I said, I mentioned these names, research these names of these people. You know, David Garrow, let me just give you a quick. David Garrow is an American author and democratic socialist. He wrote the book Bearing the Cross. Martin Luther King Jr. and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which won the 1987 Pulitzer Prize for Biography. Now, that's the historian that wrote that book, award winning book about Dr. King's life and about his work in the movement. Now, he's want to you know, revise 
Dr. King's legacy in the Me Too era. Now, he's claiming from the FBI files he recently read that Dr. King was involved in a rape, that he encouraged in a rape by a um, prominent minister named Logan Kirsch from Baltimore that was in Washington, D.C. And he encouraged the minister allegedly to rape one of his constituents, this female. So now they want to reinvent Dr. King post Me Too. They want to take him down. So the FBI allegedly has files and recordings of Dr. King involved in orgies, raping people, having sex with white prostitutes, you know, uh, even talked about him being involved in a situation in Las Vegas where the gospel great Clara Ward uh, got this white prostitute named Gail to come to his room and they had a threesome. They're doing all type of freaky stuff with the, with the white prostitute and she reported to an FBI agent what went down. So now all this stuff is coming out, but David Girl, you know why you gotta be careful. Malcolm warns about the media. David Girl co-signing this dude Muhammad could undermine what he's trying to do with Malcolm. But because a lot of us don't understand the history, don't study history, don't, don't understand these characters in these in this play known as history, we get all twisted. So David Girl is interesting to me because the first he's an advocate of Dr. King. Now he's trying to tear down a man's legacy. The man benefited. He made his career. You know, extolling the virtues of Dr. King. Now he want to turn them down. Uh, read the article that came out that he wrote last year about Dr. King and his alleged affairs, his women all over the place. You know, a uh, kid here with a, a, a married woman out in California in Los Angeles. He had a kid by her allegedly. Uh, you know, it's like it's, it's interesting to me trying to imply things about. Uh, women who were, you know, work with him, you know, as far as their relationships, you know, it's just like just gossip in, in, in any window, in any window, right? And the thing about it is, I want to help y'all out. Stop putting people on pedestals. Do not put people on pedestals. If you don't put anybody on pedestal, you will never be disappointed about what you find out about their personal lives because it is what it is. People, people, stop putting people on pedestals. This is key. Stop it. The mailman thing, once again, you get your mail from the mailbox. Do not follow the mailman around the neighborhood on his route, on his or her route. Don't follow the mail person around. Just get the mail that was meant for you out your mailbox. Receive the message. Don't embrace the messenger. Receive the message. Don't embrace the messenger. Because you'll be disappointed. Because they're just people. And to me, even Dr. King, drunk, Chain smoke, uh, I mean, drink and chain smoke and ate, you know, ate kitty cat. It doesn't change what he did for the movement. He gave his life for a cause he believed in. And that's most important. And I think that it's not realistic to want to see people in a pure sense of, I mean, you're human beings. We're in the flesh. We have, you know, vulnerabilities, frailties. We all have a dark side. I have a dark side. And we all have things, you know, little fetishes and whatnot. So this should not be uh, something that should be like really a concern. And my thing is this. If they had all this information, Dr. King, why didn't they release it during his lifetime? If this is true, what Dr. King did, Dr. King was telling Dr. King the, the honorable thing to do is to end your life. They could have ended everything by putting all this information out at, all at once during that time. Why didn't they do that? And who to say we should trust the FBI on anything? You know, think about, okay, like, you know, William Bradley, they buried, allegedly buried the information. They knew William Bradley was quite possibly the gunman, the FBI. Think about the case of uh, Geronimo Pratt, who was accused of killing, a, I believe, a school teacher at a tennis court. But he was hundreds of miles away at a Panther leadership meeting in Oakland. He was hundreds of miles away from the crime scene. The government knew this. They had him on surveillance. They had him on surveillance. They knew where he was at at the time this murder happened of this white lady. But yeah, he went to jail anyway because they withheld evidence from his court proceedings. The jury, the jury didn't know of this information. Like one of the jurors said, "Hey, we know we would not even we would have exonerated Geronimo Pratt. He would not went to jail for almost thirty years." This is Tupac's godfather. These folks, he's a, a war veteran. No. Trying to help his people. They killed his pregnant wife. My understanding from one um, source I read, they killed his pregnant wife and stuffed her in a mattress and threw her in a ravine in Los Angeles. This man went through all this stuff, shootouts with the LAPD, getting framed by the LAPD, 
and by the government, not just the LAP, by the government, spending 27 years in jail. His his lawyer was Johnny Cochran. He got out of jail in 1997. He went to live in Africa, I think Tanzania, where he died, I believe, in 2010. You look at all this stuff. This is Tupac's godfather. See, I keep on thinking Tupac was just some entertainer. He was targeted. Targeted individual. Tupac was targeted before he was born. And that's another story. But I'm saying, same old games. So the government had evidence that this guy was in a meeting hundreds of miles away from the, the murder of this woman. Yeah, they allow him to go to jail. So you trying to tell me that the government wasn't protecting William Bradley, that he wasn't an asset for the government? Y'all want to do all y'all thinking and you no, know, it's weird. And the black folks are messed up. We are tra traumatized. We've been abused. We've been abandoned. Stuff. This generational trauma, personal trauma. I remember my uncle God, may he rest in, in peace. My uncle Arthur, he, we lost him in 2003 with complications, HIV AIDS. But what happened when he was younger, uh, my grandma went to a, a, a parent-teacher conference at the elementary. My uncle Arthur, very bright, loquacious, good-natured guy. He started acting out in class and whatnot, being disruption. Teacher found out what was going on with him. They called my grandma in for a parent-teacher conference with the principal. They told my grandma the situation with my, 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 my uncle. Then they told her that they found out that he had been sexually molested by a neighborhood person, by a person in the neighborhood that they knew well. My grandma was disturbed about the information. She wanted to go tell the police, but the principal and the teacher told her, don't tell the police. Keep them out of it. Just keep them away from this predator. But somehow my uncle kept on going back or he was got involved some type of way. But the thing about it is the predator's sister lured my uncle and other boys to their home so that her brother could take advantage of these young black boys. So that was going on in a black neighborhood for years. And all the black folks knew about it, it seemed. All the adults was aware of this guy. And not only that, there was another guy. He was a uh, college professor, allegedly. Yeah, he was a college professor at the local HBCU, Lamar Owen. And also, he was a deacon, a board member at a church, a local church. And he was known. He would lure boys to his home, say, I want you to cut my grass. Then he'll just sexually molest them, take advantage of them. He did this to a, a, a large number of kids. So he had two sexual predators operating in the neighborhood, in a black neighborhood. And can you imagine this going on in Chicago and Baltimore, Los Angeles, all over? You got these neighborhoods where black folks know of these predators that they shield, that they enable, and nobody do a thing about it. So now I didn't understand at the time why my mom would not let us, my mom or grandparents, all them would not allow us. To, they didn't want us to stay over people's houses at night. Overnight, when I was looking, I couldn't understand. I said, "Man, they are friends." And, no, you can't stay over the house overnight. I didn't find out much later to what happened to my uncle, and that's why, because this situation was rampant. So I'm not going to hate nobody uh, for this situation. You got to understand the psychosis, the psychosis that, that's going on with us as a people, and what this Malcolm thing is said because you know people want to blame Malcolm for getting killed. Malcolm didn't deserve that. Malcolm didn't deserve. It. He was a believer. He was disappointed. He found out the truth. And then he still, you know what, I'm going to you know, still serve my people some type of way. The last year of his life was a lot of chaos. Uh, a lot of stuff going on. I mean, his house was bombed, firebombed on Valentine's Day. And then he's dead the next Sunday, seven days later. Still committed to the struggle. I mean, went to Detroit after his house was firebombed, do a speech, uh, making light of the situation. Daughters could have been killed. Family could have been killed. He could have been killed. That's why I tell people, when you say you want to marry somebody like Malcolm X, do you know what you're saying? When you say you want to be like Malcolm X, do you know what you're saying? When you quote Malcolm X, do you know what you're really saying? When you think about the Malcolm X assassination and Dr. Martin Luther King assassination, just remember these things. The guy who allegedly shotgun Malcolm X, William Bradley, was protected by the FBI. They did not share the information they had at the time with the authorities when they was trying the, the alleged killers of Malcolm X during the time period back in the 1960s. The alleged gun that killed Dr. King or helped kill Dr. King, because now they're saying that Dr. King was actually, actually, excuse me, finished off at St. Joseph's Hospital by the chief surgeon, 
suffocated via the pillow, but the gunshot that basically would lead to complications that took his life can be traced back to the possession of the FBI. This has been proven uh, court of law back in December 8th, 1999 in the U.S. Civil Court in Memphis, Tennessee. The U.S. government was found complicit in taking the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Now, a great book to read about the Dr. King assassination is The Plot to Kill King by Dr. William Pepper, who was James Earl Ray's lawyer and also a friend of the family of Dr. King. He knew Dr. King in life right before he passed away or was taken away, rather. Dr. King was very much influenced by his um, journalistic pursuits in the Vietnam War. As everybody know Dr. King came out against the Vietnam War April 4th, 1967 in Riverside Church in that famous speech. Uh, back in 1967, April 4th, 1967, April 4th, 1968, he was dead in Memphis, Tennessee, trying to hurt, only excuse me, trying to help, rather, uh, the sanitation workers strike, unionize the sanitation workers, get their rights, get their benefits. He died for their cause at the age of 39, the same age of Malcolm X, 39. That's significant. So y'all should read this book, Dr. William Pepper's The Plot to Kill King very much important to read that so the FBI the FBI fingerprints is all over this the FBI since the days of Marcus Mosiah Garvey agent 800 have always played a part in undermining the black liberation struggle even go back to December 4th 1969 with Chairman Fred Hampton senior of the Black Panther Party up in Chicago and Illinois where he was murdered before his fiance pregnant with his namesake by the Chicago Police Department but his chief bodyguard was the FBI informant and agent provocateur William O'Neill who took his life allegedly back in 1990 by running across the expressway in Chicago getting hit by a car so that was uh what, 30 years ago that he and now they're making a Hollywood movie about Fred Hampton's life and his relationship with the Judas, known as William O'Neill. Don't trust the Hollywood stuff. A uh, good place to start. Check out the documentary "The Murder of Fred Hampton" that came out back in the 1970s. That really traced the last years of Fred Hampton's amazing t uh, life, his 21 years of living. Uh, also, it, it talks about the murder in that documentary. You can find it online very easily. You know, just search it and it should pop up. Not that long, maybe like 90 minutes of a documentary. And also uh, read the book, The Murder of Fred Hampton. I believe it's called The Murder or The Killing of Fred Hampton by the lawyer Jeffrey Haas. That was Fred Hampton's friend and lawyer who started the People's Law Office in Chicago. They were inspired by the, um, the example of Fred Hampton who wanted, from my understanding, to be a lawyer one day. We had the skills to be a lawyer. Very persuasive, charismatic, articulate young man. That's why they took him out. So the People's Law Office actually represented the families of Fred Hampton and Mark Clark in one of the longest, if not the longest, civil trial in U.S. history, about 12 years, where they found the government guilty of killing Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. They awarded the families close to $2 million, like $1.85 million back in the early 80s. But these things are important to know. We need to know a people's history of accounting of what happened to the people when it comes to the abuses of the state. That's why we do we all be. You're not getting all this. This is not just me with my emotions and my speculations. I'm giving you facts and figures and stuff to look up. This is the power of we all be. Nobody does it like us. You know, uh, no disrespect to nobody else. I guess got my own little thing. Um, got a lot to share. So check those things out, family, uh, as we wrap this up. And also remember this. They just don't kill the people. They kill legacies. Like even with their white folks, the Kennedys, they just ain't gonna kill no JFK and RFK or try to kill a Ted Kennedy. They'll kill their families. they kill everybody. It's about legacies. They are fearful of legacies. Uh, look up the article about the government spying on Dr. King's family for three three generations. Before Dr. King was even born, they were already spying on his maternal grandfather at Ebenezer Baptist Church. You know, when Dr. King was going to Morehouse, you had spies and informants looking at him. He was 15 years old when he went to Morehouse. So they already knew the power of Dr. King. They knew the power and the uh, effectiveness of his grandfather. So they spied that family for three generations. And then you had his brother drowning under questionable circumstances, the next year after Dr. King's death, he had his mother getting shotgun 
or kill or murder in church at the uh, organ by a so-called Hebrew Israelite Marcus Wayne Chenault who passed away in prison I won't say what 95 or 2000 something like that take a look it's all online but that's funny how that family been targeted because when people talk about well, what's wrong with the King family that's what's wrong with the King family they've been targeted by the government been undermined so you you know y'all get mad at the King kids y'all don't even understand all the abuses and all the trauma they've been subjected to uh, by the U.S. government and that's why they gave their dad a holiday, a hell of a day, a statue, because they know they were complicit. Elements of the U.S. government were, were complicit in the assassination of the king. That was proven in the civil court. People said it was just civil court. Well, hell, a lot of y'all believe O.J. did it because of civil court, even though he was proven innocent or uh, not guilty in criminal court. Y'all believe the civil And not only that, the civil court trial, what happened with that was, it was not the point of even making money off of it. Cause they sued the Lloyd Jowers, I believe, for just for a dollar. The point was trying to get all the evidence to come out about what happened April 4th, 1968, and days before and after. To try to show how the government was involved. Uh, like I said before, FBI fingerprints are all over the sabotaging of the black liberation movement in this country, starting with Marcus Garvey. And no judge talking about Jack Johnson. Okay, but Marcus Garvey, see, that's the blueprint for what they did to the leaders in the 60s. You know, they set up Marcus Garvey for mail fraud back in the 20s. They deported him from America via New Orleans, the port of New Orleans. You know, Marcus Garvey's strongest uh, advocacy in the country was Louisiana. He had a stronghold in Louisiana. Matter of fact, you know, you talk about Malcolm X assassination, there was a guy named Reverend James Eason. That's how any information on Reverend James Eason online. But he was kind of like a Malcolm X of the uh, Marcus Garvey movement. And they said allegedly he was trying to become an informant for the government to betray Marcus Garvey. And the followers down there in New Orleans at the Black House assassinated Reverend James Eason uh, to stop him from snitching on Marcus Garvey, allegedly. But he's a forgotten figure. I think he should be worth study, but it's hard to find a lot of information on Reverend James Eason. That's why it's important as we as black people to write these and research these stories and put it out there on our own terms instead of waiting for white folks to say, oh, this guy's deemed or she's worthy of remembrance. You know, we all get caught up in because I got a lot of stuff when we all be, we was covering for anybody else was covering and now, you know, y'all hip to it because white folks says worthy to be remembered. They're worthy. They're validated. You know, no, let's go look. It's a lot of stuff. Look up Joe Pullen. Joe Pullen out of Mississippi, a Garveyite who took on a white mob and killed a couple of white folks before they killed him. Think about Robert Charles down in New Orleans. Think about Robert F. Williams, who actually got in shootouts with the Klan with his wife, survived the real Queen and Slim. A lot of y'all was even hip to that, and I turned y'all on to that when I did the Queen and Slim review. Stop letting these Hollywood weird movies poison your mind about our abilities to win and fight back and win. We can actually win and we believe in ourselves. Robert F. Williams, like he said, when they was fighting back against the Klan and stuff back in the 50s, they didn't lose nobody. They did, they drove down, they draw down on policemen and everything. Look up Robert F. Williams in his own words on YouTube. You know, him talking about this stuff as an older man. You know, he got to live past 39, unlike Malcolm and Martin and Megger. He got the chance to live until be 71. Yeah, he died from leukemia or complications from cancer, but and he's 71. He fought back against the government. He was a fugitive, he was a fugitive, an enemy of the state. Went to Cuba, went to China, came back a hero, able to help the government leverage. Uh, a relationship with China normalize the reason why we got a relationship with China today as the United States of America is because that what this black man provided the government with intel when he was a guest of honor him and his wife of Chairman Mao and Chow and Lei over in China back in the 60s man was a guest of honor of Fidel Castro and Che Guevara in Cuba back in the 1960s he did Radio Free Dixie which is the inspiration for radio I mean News Free Dixie we all be so I'm telling you all this stuff. You're not going to get a lot of this stuff from a lot of places. You know, people too busy talking about celebrity BS and, you know, who care about what so-and-so thing. I don't care about all that. But I do talk about that a lot of times to put it in some type of historical context and to reclaim the narrative. just like I'm doing now. So think about what they did to Malcolm's family after he passed away. Or after they killed him and he passed away. They took him away. Think about uh, Corbilla Shabazz, who was set up by the FBI, by the government, saying that she was trying to kill Farrakhan, her boyfriend, some white Jewish guy who was an FBI agent, 
uh, try to put in the air that you know you should assassinate Farrakhan because he allegedly killed your father. You know they try to, no, but this is right before the Million Man March, right? This is back what 94, 95. You know, look at all that stuff. Kabila Shabazz was set up then. Farrakhan came to Betty Shabazz's family, sister Betty Shabazz, the Ma uh, widow of Malcolm X. They met at the historic meeting in Sh at the Apollo Theater where they embraced. Things were forgiven. And not always forgiven, but you know, just for the sake of the daughter of Malcolm X, they had a fundraiser for her defense. Eventually, she was able to beat the case, but Kabila Shabazz's son, Malcolm X's grandson, Malcolm Latif Shabazz, was accused of setting the fire up in Yonkers in his grandma's condo apartment that killed her. You know, she was severely burned, third degree burns, 80% of her body. They say he did it, you know, in that Lifetime movie that came out, Betty and Coretta, which was historically inaccurate. I'm surprised that the families okayed that movie because I saw them endorse it in commercials or whatever. I don't know. But that movie was not, it was not accurate. They showed, for example, they showed uh, Coretta talking to Betty in the hospital after the, the fire incident. This woman was severely burned over 80% of her body, 30 degree burns. She wasn't in no type of state of mind to be talking uh, to Betty, I mean, to Coretta Scott King. I mean, they had a relationship because of their, you know, the widows of these famous black icons, but that movie really exaggerated some things, dramatic effect, but she was not in no state of mind to be talking. Think about all the surgery she had to endure, skin grafts and stuff, trying to say, well, like, she was burned over, almost 100% of her body was burned, third degree. So she didn't look like that in the movie, in the, in the movie no disrespect, but... She wasn't on bill. And then they had Malcolm's grandson looking way older than he looked. He was just like 12 years old. He was barely 12 years old when that happened to his grandma back in 1997. And then I remember the 2013 was also the year that Malcolm's grandson got killed in Mexico City under mysterious circumstances. We still don't really know what happened with that. But there's like a lot of international intrigue. I don't be surprised that, you know, our government played a hand in the assassination of Brother Malcolm's grandson because he was on the path of becoming like his grandfather. And you know, Malcolm in that Malcolm X autobiography talked about how the uh, strong black men in his family were taken down, especially on his father's side. His father and his father's brothers were murdered because of their strong stance as men. So he had the grandson embracing that legacy of his grandfather and it cost him his life at the age of 28. And people still think that, you know, before they assassinate the person, they assassinate the person's character. It's like with Malcolm X and Dr. King, before they were assassinated, their character was assassinated via the media. So the same thing with Malcolm Shabazz, Latif Shabazz, the grandson, his character was assassinated in the media before they actually assassinated the person. See, that movie came out and then all of a sudden he's dead a month later. Yeah, you know, you know, you know, like the same with the Kobe Bryant BS, you know, that helicopter crash in that cartoon was almost four years ago and he's dead almost similar ways y'all won't call things coincidence you talking to the wrong person if you believe in coincidence i'm not that guy i don't believe in no coincidence i don't believe in accidents i just believe things happen a lot of us don't have an understanding why things happen because we don't have a clue about how things work we don't have an understanding why and how things happen because we don't have a, a clue about how and, and why things work the way they do and this comes from studying it comes from trusting yourself, intuition. I don't have to prove anything when I know it. You know, I don't know. I don't have to prove that somebody was murdered to anybody. I know they were murdered and I don't have to prove it. It's like, y'all know that Jesus is this. Y'all don't have to prove it to me. I know that they were murdered. I don't have to prove it to y'all. Because I'm not interested in getting y'all validation. What I'm interested in, I'm sharing my point of view. You can share your point of view. Let's do research and come to our own, our own conclusions. And let's put it out there and see what happens. You'd be surprised. Think about how the families were attacked. Not just the, the they killed the legacies. So Kobila Shabazz, they tried to get her on the trying to kill Farrakhan thing. They couldn't get her, so they got her son, Malcolm's grandson, who's going to carry on that legacy. Think about Malcolm had a whole bunch of daughters, right? He had no sons. Uh, these beautiful black women. I don't, I don't think, you know, I think about Ilyasha. I don't know her situation. She's gorgeous. And she remind me of her father. She look like a mom and a father. She got that spirit, but she does she have any kids? Is she married? This stuff is trauma. They were there when their father was taken down. You know, 
it's like coming out the brother Paul White where he said a couple years ago about a lot of men, black men, the making of Hollywood, they got to act effeminate or choose to be gay. They choose to be gay just to get ahead, just to navigate the system. I mean, the system, you look at what's going on with the emasculation of our sons and other stuff that's going on. Well, I guess gay is the new black, you know, and it's not knocking people. But the thing about it is where they do this so we won't help Robert F. Williams's and, and, and Malcolm X's and, and Mega Evers. They don't want us to have those type of black men. And they want to make this about black men versus black women because they know that when we work together as a black family, we're unstoppable. And that's about it. Uh, but they look, study out what had to do to families. I mean, Mega Evers, you know, look what happened to him, man. You know, you don't see no 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 Mega Evers like type of character come out. No disrespect, not disrespecting the family, but man, that's a different generation, man. And we don't even have that type of black leadership. We don't have no Adam Clayton Powell Jr. today in Congress, person with that type of death. I mean, they, and they try to character assassinate Adam Clayton Powell Jr. in that uh, Godfather of Harlem stuff. They just they just. I like John Carlos Esposito, but you know, no nah, man, you know he was not just no head, you know, chicken, you know, skirt chasing cat. This get this guy was real serious about liberating black people, and that side needs to be told. A uh, good movie by Adam Clayton Powell Jr. is uh, "Keep the Faith, Baby" with Vanessa Williams playing his wife Hazel Scott, the first black woman to have a TV show and a pioneer entertainer in terms of. I mean, she was a phenomenal piano player and singer. She's not even talking about today, and Adam Clayton Powell Jr. is not really talked about like he should be. The man was serious. He was not no court jester like they portrayed him in The Godfather of Harlem. He was more than that. He was probably the greatest politician from black America in the history of the country who got the job done the best he could. But it was taken down because, you know, he wanted to be authentic. He didn't want to hide his frailties or his vices or shortcomings. And he was honest about, you know, his love of women and, you know, the finer things in life. But he took care of his people. He was doing stuff, boycotts and all this stuff in the 30s when Dr. King was barely a uh, barely a, 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 a baby. He was already doing this stuff that Dr. King and then was doing in the 50s. He was doing it back in the 30s. You understand? So we need to honor our people and write our stories and, and tell our stories uh, in, a, in a better way. But yeah, that's why I wanted to add that the families were attacked you know, after the, the icons were, 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 were killed. Their families were under the attack and they're still probably under attack then what we got to understand, so when we try to blame each other for what happened to each other, we got to understand the things, the hidden hands behind that. We got to study the system and why it is that uh, people from a mosque were able to take down one of their own people who have started mosques for their organization because they're not really the, the mastermind. It's like when people, uh, I'm going to close it up. Ernest Wood is the famous civil rights photographer. A lot of people think that he was the one to kill King. No, he was utilized by the system to document and, and held King on the surveillance through his photographs. You know what I'm saying? He was a freelance photographer. You know, and you were you a freelance photographer. Like, you know, you work for anybody. They, people buy pictures from you. They might ask, hey, you know, who was this picture? Like, what is this about? This is so, 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 so. But he didn't do anything to undermine Dr. King's effectiveness as a leader. He was just uh, documenting Dr. King for the government. Just like right now, your smartphones and your your smart TVs are spying on spying on you, spying on us. You know, we think we turn things out. They're listening to us. The NSA and all these people are listening to the civilians because we live in fear. We just willing to give our liberties for fear. Like what something like Benjamin Franklin said, if you are, you know, the paraphrase of Benjamin Franklin said once upon a time, uh, if you are scared of your freedom, you don't deserve freedom. I mean, like if you believe in, um, if fear is your religion, then you don't deserve no freedom. That's what I'm saying. If fear is your religion, this system runs and thrives off your fears. If fear is your religion, if you are afraid of freedom, you don't deserve no freedom. You don't deserve your liberties. That's all I got to say about that. That's all I got to say. So thank y'all uh, as we move along in this process of understanding and knowing thyself. So study this stuff. I think I gave y'all enough information. I mean, I'm sorry it's like I'm all over the place, but it's so much information, man. I gave y'all names, do the research, gave y'all things to look at, different perspectives, a better understanding and context of things. I would say to people, uh, for those trying to figure out about Malcolm X's legacy and what happened to him, the Netflix documentary ain't a bad place to start, but keep on digging deeper and steeper into the situation. Like I said, check out my playlist. 
that will have in the link box below. In the video box below, have a link to my playlist. I interview Ronnell Collins, the nephew of Malcolm X, A. Peter Bailey, a worker, a collaborator with Malcolm X. He was there when Malcolm got killed in the Ottoman. Also, he was a part of Malcolm's organization for Afro American Unity. Uh, man, Malcolm just didn't have enough time. They didn't allow him to have the time. He was just 39 years old. You got to think about that. Well, and Dick Gregory, of course, Roland Shepard, the white socialist who sold newspapers at the rallies, who was there the, Malcolm, the day that Malcolm got killed. Um, even interviewed a guy that got the missing chapters, a lawyer who was in possession of the missing chapters from the Alex Haley Malcolm X autobiography. Um, interviewed Dr. Manny Marable. And back in July 2007, I had the honor and pleasure of interviewing Dr. Manny Marable. The book didn't come out until like 2011. So I was asking him about the gay thing, because, you know, in the book, he claimed that Malcolm X was gay and all this stuff, but that's confusing to me. That's confusion because the Malcolm X that we know wasn't gay. Now, Malcolm Little, Detroit Red, now Detroit Red could have been a male prostitute, and it's hard to prove whatever Malcolm's sexual activities were in prison. I mean, he had his, uh, his friend, his best friend, Shorty, Malcolm Jarvis, I believe his name, who Spike Lee portrayed in the Malcolm X biopic, talk about their, their, you know, their activities in terms of their street life activities and stuff like that. But I remember the thing about Malcolm X being gay first came up in a, a book written by a white professor named Bruce Perry back in the 90s. And um, I think other things talked about the positive, but it's hard to prove that. And it really is not even important at this, at this late date to talk about Malcolm's sexuality because his, his agenda was not about his own personal sexuality. It was about the agenda for the liberation of black Americans and black people in general. That's what Malcolm was about. The Malcolm X that we celebrate is about that. Don't make him no, no LGBTQ icon. It's not, you got by Rustin. You know, we know what Byron Rustin was about. But don't make, you can't put that on Malcolm. Another thing about Malcolm, it's like Kobe. They tried to assassinate Malcolm's character in death, but Malcolm's bulletproof. In death, he's bulletproof. He wasn't bulletproof in life, but in death, it's hard to, to put a Malcolm X in a dress. It's hard to put lipstick on Malcolm X. Malcolm X, that's our shining black manhood. Like Ozzy Davis said in his eulogy, that's our shining black manhood. And with that said, family, I want to thank you all for listening to me. I hope I gave y'all something to, to think about to chew on until uh, the next time. If you like the words from Brother Herb, please spread the word. We all be TV, YouTube, we all be TV. Subscribe, tell your friends. Support the movement. Knowledge is the currency of the universe. Knowledge and free. I pay a price. You pay a price. It takes time to get this information out there just to push it out to you all. You know, if you like the words come out of my mouth, support it. Cash app, dollar sign, R2C2H2. That's cash app, dollar sign, R2C2H2. And also, uh, you can do PayPal or Google Pay. Email r2c2h2 at gmail.com. That's email r2c2h2 at gmail.com. And um, by Art of His Art, r2c2h2.com. That's r2c2h2.com. Or well, you can wear Art of His Art. You got my Dick Gregory, Paul Mooney, Richard Pryor, Three Kings shirt on. Get that out of Teespring website. You know, you see the Teespring shelf below. Uh, click on that and we'll be updating. Also, if you'd like to see something you saw on my artist website, the r2c2h2.com website, if you'd like to see some of that artwork on t-shirts, let me know. We'll make it happen. I know people say they're serious about purchasing, but I make it easy for y'all to support what we do. I'm putting all the links everywhere. But you know, that's how it is. People are so distracted. It's hard for people to do critical thinking or follow direction. But I want to thank everybody who have been following direction, who have been supporting this thing for a long, long time, be consistent in their giving and their support and their love and their encouragement. Like I said, especially when we hear me uh, hear me talk about something, make a donation. Make a donation. And I might consider it if it's a good donation. <laughs> thank you all. God bless. In the words of the great Duke Ellington, we love you madly. Keep producing and pushing.
got it. This is Brother Ron. I am asking you all to do me a big favor. Think about supporting the We All Be movement. Your donation is tax deductible. The We All Be Group Incorporated is a recognized 501c3. And I'm just asking you all because I want to keep on bringing y'all quality work uh, through the way that I know how to do best. And uh, I'm going to sing my praises and toot my horn. A lot of y'all would not help to dig Gregory until Brother Ron brought him on the We All Be platform, until that Django review we did. Y'all seen another side of Judge Joe Brown, and Judge Joe Brown's message has been amplified. But it was We All Be that brought Judge Joe Brown to y'all back in 2014. And so many others. And we covered so many things. So help us out so we can help you all. Peace.